This is all about uh, people sharing what they, they've invested their lives in and what they're passionate about. Uh, the, the name Ragged University comes from uh, the inspiration of the Ragged Schools. Before 1870, free education was delivered by communities to communities. Philanthropists and entrepreneurs fostered each other with their mutual exchange of knowledge. Uh, myself and a number of people thought this was such a good idea. Why not update it? And so today you find uh, these informal gatherings where, where people come up and give a short talk or any kind of presentation and uh, help us find a way into what they've spent their lives doing. So today, uh, we're, uh, I've got the pleasure of introducing Colin Watt, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, um, the Ruskin College strike, which, uh, if you don't know about Ruskin College, this is a very unique and interesting history of the institution. And also, we've got uh, Robert Turnbull, and um, he's going to be talking about the, the Pledge League in the north of England. Um, the Pledge League is uh, an amazing history, also uh, uh, unique in that uh, uh, working class communities came together to foster knowledge. Uh, but I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, uh, that's why we're here to listen to them. Um, I'd like you to relax and enjoy, and please. Oh, oh, and, uh, oh well. relax and enjoy me first. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I'll introduce. Thanks, you. Alex. Go on. My name is Keith Venables. This was my name. Terrible. And Colin, Rob, and the few dozen people have been organising events like this, and very love to have the hosts of Red University in, uh, in Edinburgh. Events of this kind for about two years now have had 30 or 40 meetings across, across the country, Brighton you know, to Manchester to Leeds, London, South Wales, and so on. But we would like to kind of use the principle that Alex just outlined, which is that we're here today to have a discussion together. And I think you will enjoy Colin's initial presentation. This comes from his book, Plebs, which came out in 2009, and Rob's more recent book. Pay attention. There was more recent book, suddenly a book here, I just watch. Yeah. <laughs> it came out about, actually this one's still wet, about two weeks ago. Yes. So these are both on the theme that we're going to pursue. So the idea will be that initially, Colin will speak for 15 minutes or so on the basic ideas, and then we'll have some kind of discussion, maybe even ask some things of you. And then Rob will speak and have a question and answer. So lots of involvement. Does everyone think they can hear from where you're sitting? Okay, please feel free to do two things. One, if you do need to go home for your tea, or obviously why should be here, it's nice to thank you for that. Then please do feel it's people will walk in or walk out. But if you'd like to stay, that'd be nice as well. And secondly, move forward if you feel you need to. So, Alex has done it. Over to you. Oh, right. thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to say that um, if uh, there may well be people here that know more about aspects of what I was going to talk, what I'm going to talk about than I know myself. So uh, that would be good if that's one thing, because I've found from speaking up and down the country about it, there are people that do, and also at the same time, um, uh, if this, if I come out with something that is not clear to you, I think it's good. I don't know. If you, I don't, are you cheering? That as well, but well, I shall need to. Well, if, some, if I come out with something that somebody doesn't understand, and if, and if it would be helpful to them to have it explained at that point, they might as well just ask. I think is that okay? Yeah. Right. So, so, um, but just to explain then that um, if, if in um, 2000, I'm not an academic, by the way. I'm just a, I'm just a further education teacher. That's all right for 44 years. Uh, basically, just to explain to you that I. Um, in, in 2009, that was 100 years after the Ruskin College student strike in 1909, I, I thought it should, the centenary of it should be marked, and so then I, I wrote this leaflet, this, this pamphlet rather, and as far as I know, that, that was the only attempt to mark that event, basically. 
Right, so, so and I thought that when I did this, I would not at all surprised that it would have ended up in boxes in my bedroom, but far from that being the case, uh, I was astonished at the interest in it, uh, and, and not in this uh, site, but in the event. And I, I was astonished, you know, the, the knowledge that people had about it. And there's kind of reservoirs of knowledge about it. So I'm full of, that's what I mean when I say there might be people here that know more about aspects of it than me. So um, is that okay? So I'm, I'm just going to speak about that event. But I, I'm, I try to get across the idea that I think it's very significant for us now. It's not about raking up something, an obscure thing in the past. It's about something that's important now. All right? Well, I mean, you don't have to agree, but I'm just, that's what I'm trying to show you. Right, so, so um, the, basically the background of it is, I think, something like this, that after the Chartist movement, after the Chartist movement um, suffered a big the political movement of Chartism suffered a big reverse in 1848, there emerged amongst um, uh, kind of upper class people, a section of people, Christian socialists, who thought that they could prevent something like that happening again by using adult education to, com to create a compliant layer amongst working class people. Okay? That, 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 that set, there was a group of people like that and um, they, they, they made a number of attempts to do that. So in the 1870s then, the main university, Oxford and Cambridge University, obviously I'm talking about England now because that's where this occurred, but there was a, I fully understand that there was a tradition here, a very powerful tradition around John McLean. Go, go on. Okay. A powerful tradition around John McLean and there was a movement for a Scottish Labour College that was going on at the same time as this. But I'm speaking about what happened at Ruskin College for the moment. Okay, but if you want to talk about that, I think we will. Uh, so anyway, they, they, they were, during the 1870s, both Oxford and Cambridge Universities created what they called extension networks. So they would send lecturers around to various parts of the country to give one-off, high-profile lectures uh, were, that were intended to draw in people who would be normally excluded from university education. And, um, and the, the, there were various other measures of that type that they did. But it didn't, it didn't work. It was quite clear by the end of the 1800s that that was not doing what they wanted it to do. It was not drawing in the people who would be working class activists and turn, turning them into a sort of compliant layer. So um, it, it, at the same time, it was clear that um, kind of socialist ideas about the world were spreading very strongly about amongst working class people and they were themselves reading um, le learning, you know, they were reading and educating themselves very strongly in that, in those sort of ideas. That this was a time when people would go without uh, food if necessary to obtain a book to read, and they would risk the sack, you know, by reading it at work and things like that. So it was a very powerful movement amongst the minority of industrial workers to do that. So the, these two things were both happening, and. Um, I would like to say something now, if I could, about the origins of Ruskin College. Okay, I'm just going to explain something about how that came about. So Ruskin College in Oxford was set up by two American postgraduate students at Oxford University. And um, those two wanted to create a network of kind of socialist education colleges and classes across the whole of England and Wales, uh, and basically they um, they established what they call Ruskin halls in a number of towns, of which the main one was the one in Oxford, which was part of the, which was a, a residential college, but was not part of the university. And they used the, the money for that came from from the wife Emily Vrooman, who was the wife of one of those people. We can talk about how it was funded if you like. But anyway. So that basically they set that up, but the only only part of that network which survived for any length of time was the college in Oxford. Okay, so so they appointed as the principal of that college a chap called Dennis Hurd. Um, Dennis Hurd was a very high prof it was a high profile sort of 
he was a former clergyman, but he was also a high profile socialist. He, he wrote a book which is called Jesus the Socialist, which sold, supposedly sold 70,000 copies. So he, he, so he was quite a high, high profile person, as you can see. In the, in the early years at Ruskin College, a variety of people came from all over the place, from different backgrounds to that college as residential students. But by 1902, it was quite clear that nearly all the students there were people supported by their trade union branches. So it had become, in effect, like a sort of labour college, you might call it. In 1902, the two people that set it up, or three people, if you like, returned to the United States. And from that point on, they withdrew, their, their, their financial support for it was basically withdrawn from that point. And the result was that it was in a state of jeopardy with regard to its funding from that point on. Are we, are we all okay so far? Yeah? Okay. Right, so it was in a, a state of difficulties about its funding. Right, I want to stop, break off from that for a moment now and say something about the Workers' Education Association and how it was set up, because that's part of the story. Okay, so, so the Workers' Education Association was, was in the late eight, uh, 1890s, the founder of that, a man called Albert Mansbridge, offered to the, ex the university extension movement, which I've mentioned, a possible solution to the problem of the fact that extension courses were not drawing in people and were not creating a compliant layer like they wanted to create. And his solution to that was the idea of tutorial classes. In other words, he said they, they, what they should do is organise kind of more structured, more systematic, longer classes for small groups of people who, who, which would lead to a diploma or a qualification, rather than just some kind of one-off large-scale lectures. And they thought that that would attract working class people to those, rather than the kind of middle class people who'd come to dominate the extension movement. Is that right? We have yeah. So that was his idea. And he, he, when he offered that idea to the Oxford University Extension Delegacy, uh, they saw the merits of that, that idea straight away and they backed it very strongly from that moment on. Now, just to say something about Mansbridge himself, he was a working class product of the Extension movement himself, but he was also an ardent convert to what's called Anglo Catholicism the Anglo-Catholic Church, and he very much liked kind of mingling with bishops and others who were involved in the Oxford University Extension Movement. So he was kind of obsessed with, fascinated by that kind of thing. And his big idea, as I say, was tutorial classes. Um, and he proposed that these classes should be put on all over the country that would attract people like trade union activists and would-be Labour councillors and such like into them and they would be drawn into a structure of qualifications which would lead to them doing a special diploma in economics at Oxford University. All right? So instead of, yeah, so, and, um, this idea was eagerly embraced, as I said, and not only that, the state or the government in the form of the, the Board of Education put money into it. They wrote into the 1902 Education Act a clause authorising local authorities to fund such classes. So obviously the funding is crucial, isn't it, you know, to pay the, to pay the <coughs> student, uh, teaching if possible. So in 1903 then, on the back of all that, then the, the Workers' Education Association was founded by Albert Mansbridge, and that is its origin. Right. Now I just want to say something now about what was going on at, amongst a certain layer of people at Oxford University at that time. There was at that time in Oxford University a group of young upper-class Christian Socialist Oxford tutors who very strongly supported the approach that Albert Mansbridge had. Among these tutors were the future Archbishop of Canterbury, a man called William Temple, and the historian R.H. Tawney, and a number of other well people who became prominent for other reasons later. And these people, what they were trying to do was convince the more reactionary side of that university that they should support an extent support drawing in working class people into it in some way. And they formed a secret, a semi-secret sort of partly joking but partly serious group called the Catiline Club, uh, which was meant to do that. That's what they were trying to do. 
And of course, as the level of kind of industrial militancy amongst working class people rose in the early 1900s in the lead up to what was called the Great Unrest, it became more and more urgent to, be, to do these things successfully and try and do what they wanted to do. So the, 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 the WEA and U, Oxford University Extension Group needed a, a, an institution that would be like a halfway house between the, the adult education classes spread around, the, the tutorial classes around the country and Oxford University itself. And they obviously that earmarked Ruskin College as that institution. So they had an interest in trying to gain control of it from that point onwards. All right, okay. Yeah, so I just want to say something about the general politics that was going on amongst working class activists or a minority of such activists at that time. So, um, along with the rapid growth of trade union activity and so forth that was going on at that time, um, and the growth of interest in ideas, there was also a kind of from below movement amongst uh, industrial work, sections of industrial workers, and especially when the Liberal government came to power, hello, hello, come in, in, in 1906, um, and one of the things that they did was to give jobs to trade union leaders or um, administering their uh, welfare reforms. And, and also there was disappointment at the performance of the 37 or so people who'd been elected for the first time in 1906 as Labour MPs. So there was a kind of groundswell of from below discontent with the existing leadership of unions and, and of the Labour Party. And um, in that context, against that background, a set of ideas that came actually from an American academic socialist, Daniel de Leon, became rapidly influential. That was partly because there were publications available from the States with his ideas that weren't otherwise available. Um, and in Scotland, particularly, a group formed around his ideas called the Socialist Labour Party. We can talk about the background of that group if you want to, but basically they, they published something which de Leon, Daniel de Leon had said in 1902, a speech, in a form, which is called Two Pages from Roman History. So what he did, he was speaking about what happened in ancient Rome in 494 BC, in which the, work, the poor people in ancient Rome withdrew from the city let them walked out of the city and refused to go on working and so forth. So it was like a kind of secession. And um, what he, he was drawing at that stage, then the ruling class in ancient Rome created what were called, hello, come in, tribunes of the people who, who would supposedly represent those people. And the parallel was between, uh, but, but it was argued really they betrayed them. So the parallel was between those tribunes of the people and the existing trade union leaders and uh, Labour MPs. Right. So, um, just to say then that, I want to say something briefly about the nature of the universities in at least England, I mean, that's the context of this at that time. So these the universities in England, in contrast to what on the rest of, in the rest of Europe at that time, they didn't, whereas the universities on the continent produced uh, a layer of a small layer of people who were nevertheless very who, who threw in their lot were traditional intellectuals, but who threw in their lot with the working class movement. And we can mention the famous names of many of those from Karl Marx onwards. In this country, it was different, it, or in, in England, it was different, and that was because um, what the universities here basically produced Anglican clergy, clergymen civil servants and colonial administrators and such like and there was no such radicalised layer. So my argument is the effect of that was that working class people that were trying to educate themselves in ideas had to do it for themselves in a way that was not, not so necessary in other countries. So they were forced to think it through for themselves more deeply perhaps than was the case elsewhere in some cases. So. We should also bear in mind that a lot of the things that are regarded as crucial texts now, that sort of thing, were not available at that time in translation. Right, uh, are we okay with that so far? 
Yeah, so I'm just going to move on to talk about something. A famous report was produced called Oxford and Working Class Education. So I just want to explain something about the background to that report. And um, then we'll see how that connects to what we're saying. In 1907, the leadership of the TUC, um, having been lobbied for years on end to try to put financial support behind Ruskin College and save it from the financial instability that it was in, finally agreed to circulate all the constituent unions with a, an appeal to support it. So hitherto, the trade union students that had gone there were backed by their individual branches. But now it looked as if the whole movement would actually put financial support behind it. In other words, there was a chance that it would now have a secure future as a college for trade union people that were coming there as full-time students. Okay, so the effect of that was that the WEA and the Oxford University Extension Delegacy realised that unless they took control of it fairly quickly, uh, that the chance would be, would go. All right, so, um, therefore they began to take active steps to do that. At their, in each summer, there was a joint meeting in Oxford of the WEA and the Oxford University Extension Delegacy. And in August 1907, at that meeting, then a decision was taken to set up a group of people who would write a report, a powerful and influential report, advocating that um, Oxford University should make a decisive turn towards joining working class people. And this report was going to be called Oxford and Working Class Education. And it was the people that were due to write it. Some of them were drawn from the Catiline Club that I've mentioned to you before, it's like R.H. Tawney. Other ones were people like Albert Mansbridge from the WEA. So they were, they were to get together and write this report that was expected to be very influential. And uh, they, they did, in fact, do that. They wrote the, you can read the report now if you want to. And um, basically, it's a very, very, very thorough report. It goes into detail about the kind of teaching and, and learning, or, or at least the syllabuses that should be available and taught to working class people who come to such things. Uh, and it tells you in detail how the, how the lecturers should deal with the problem of students who've informed themselves about that beforehand. So, how to deal with a student who read a lot of Marx, how an economics lecturer should deal with the problem of a student who knows more about. Marxist ideas, and for example, they did, because that was quite becoming a problem at Ruskin College, because most of the students, most of the lecturers at Ruskin College were uh, <coughs> part-time, there were people from Oxford University, economics lecturers, for example, who were teaching at Ruskin College, and whose, uh, whose version of economics didn't go down very well with the radicalised students that were there. So, that, you know, that was, that was an actual concrete problem in the practice of teaching there. Right, now, if you're, if you're clear about that, I'll just go on to say something about the WEA, or I've described how the WEA was set up, but it wasn't, it hadn't at this stage got any functioning tutorial classes, but in 1908, the first two such classes were set up. One in a place in Longton, Stafford, which is in Stanley Potteries, part of Staffordshire, and one in Rochdale, in, in the northwest of England. And both of these were tutored by um, R.H. Tawney, who at that time, well basically, he, they, were, they were tutored by him, they were, they were in economic history, and they were, it's quite clear that they were being successful. That, that a lot of working class people did enrol on them, and they were being sustained on, so the Mansbridge's idea was working. Okay? It, it was beginning, it seemed to be doing what it had been claimed it would do. And so, um, I'd just like to say something now about the ideas about education that the, college, that the students at Ruskin College in 1908 had, what their ideas were. They had very, very distinctive and clear-cut ideas about what ed adult education for working class activists should be. There were 50, about 54 such students. Most of them were mine workers from South Wales. Well, come in. Come in. And uh, most of them were mine workers from South Wales. And some of them were from the northeast, and were also railway workers, but also engineering workers, especially from textile industries, right? And, and so, um, their idea of what education in that context should be—they call it. Come in. Sorry, no problem. And so anyway, they—they they called it independent work. They said. Uh, 
Yeah. They called it independent working class education. That was their term they used. So, so they, they were completely opposed to the model of education that the WEA and the extension movement was promoting. So then, the, the idea that uh, working class people needed above all access to the kind of teaching that could be provided by lecturers from Oxford University um, was not, they, they thought that was not a good idea at all. They, they, they thought that they did not revere mainstream higher education of the type that was available at that time in the way that the WEA did. They called it orth that orthodox education and they saw it as enslaving and necessarily miseducating people like the people who they were interested in. And they thought the content of adult education for working class activists should consist of three elements in a socialist economics, industrial history, that means the history of the world without leaving working class people out of it, and philosophy. Right, now I just want, if, if it's all right with you, I'll just quickly say something about what they meant by philosophy, because that might be significant. There, what they mean by philosophy, the main thing that they looked to was a German leather worker, Josef Dietzken, who arrived at a kind of form of dialectical philosophy, independently of the mainstream philosophers, which is somewhat comparable to Hegel's notion of dialectics. Uh, and so they looked to this person who was basically a worker uh, as the kind of best model of philosophy. But what they, the, what they wanted was philosophy that would make it possible for you to reason things out, for a person who hadn't gone through a formal education, to reason things out for themselves in such a way that they could argue in any company for their ideas, including the company against, for example, Oxford University lecturers. Um, they also, the, the students that were at Ruskin College at that time, also had an, an ideas about teaching and learning method. So they favoured a highly participatory teaching and learning method. And th this method is quite likely that it derived from where we're sitting at this moment, more or less, because it seems likely that the Socialist Labour Party group that was in Edinburgh at that time, there was a man in that group called George Yates, who was an engineering worker, but was also a technician at Edinburgh University. And he seemingly may have devised this participatory teaching and learning method in which a text would be read round the, round the group of people, a classic sort of socialist text. They would read it round the class, carefully discussing each bit of it, and then they would go out to engage in public speaking, often to very hostile audiences, and then they would come back, this is usually on a Sunday afternoon, and then come back and review the outcome of doing that. So one can see that that potentially a very, very powerful method of training people to speak. And uh, so I think credit to him should probably go for that method. Um, the students at Ruskin began to organise their own classes within Ruskin University along the lines of that. And uh, now what happened now was that the, the WEA and the University Extension Movement began to take Take, make moves to take over Ruskin College. So once the draft of the report working, Oxford and Working Class Education had been circulated, which was in mid-1908, the management of Oxford University began to make these moves. They, they began to put their supporters on the staff of Ruskin College, which they had the power to do, and they moved some of the governors who supported their ideas to a more powerful position. They restructured, the, the, the executive of the college was restructured, so that the authority of the principal, who I've mentioned to you, Dennis Hurd, was undermined. So he'd been the principal since 1899, he was on a good relationship with the student, but his, his um, authority was now undermined. They introduced compulsory exams to decide whether students could go from the first year to the second year. Before that, there was nothing like that. They banned her, Dennis Hurd from teaching sociology at a time when sociology was not taught anywhere else in Oxford. The students were also banned from public speaking, but these students, the people that were there that were the students, were people who were in their, they were very, very um, 
what should we say, active people. There were people who were accustomed to going around speaking. It's specifically within Oxford, they used to each Sunday speak at, there's a thing called the Martyrs Memorial there, which they used to speak at. And when they did that, that was not, that's not a light matter because the, student, the kind of upper class students at Oxford were quite happy to attack them physically while they were doing that. And there's plenty of evidence of that being the case. So there's a, a, you know, that's an important thing in their lives. And, but they also used to travel around the country speaking, so they were banned from doing that. At the same time, all lectures at Ruskin College were made compulsory. So when I explained before that they were beginning to be dissatisfied with the kind of lectures they were receiving from the staff who were brought in from Oxford University, so that, that in itself was significant. Right, so these things are like the stick, but at the same time there was like a kind of carrot was brought to them, and that was prominent people in Oxford began to invite them out to tea or to, or to kind of um, what should we say, be nice to them. So in, in, in particular, then there's one particular thing I need to mention. The, the Chancellor of Oxford University, Lord Curzon, who was a former Viceroy of India, on a famous occasion in October 1908, came to Ruskin College to meet the students uh, and to meet the principal. And this episode has been described quite often. And there was a kind of a stand-up argument between Dennis Hurd and Lord Curzon about the college and what it should become. And uh, which basically heard argued that the college should be um, in a pro it should be a labour college standing in a proper relation to the working class movement, the labour movement, and um, that obviously heard um, appeared to win that argument, and so Lord Curzon then turned on his heel and left, supposedly. Uh, and so basically, at the same time, they also began to. They, kind of, they began to put articles in upper-class upper kind of periodicals advocating their view of what Ruskin College should become. And uh, one of these articles was uh, written by the vice principal of Ruskin College, Charles Buxton. And he, I need to explain. I just want to quote one tiny little bit out of it. He said he, he spoke about Ruskin College as being an idealist experiment in Fike Romuli. So I don't, I don't need to translate that, but you can see that he meant it was a way of referring to the Ruskin College students as the dregs of the British Empire. That would be the politest way to translate that. We did assume then, Colin, we don't know Latin. We do all know Latin. Yes, yeah, right, 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 right. so it's not very polite. You know, you, you, no, I wouldn't be, be too pleased to be called that. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Right, right, right. Right, so, anyway, so, anyway, it's not very nice. You wouldn't be too pleased to be described in that way. So, the, um, at the same time, then, the kind of the powers that be were trying to organise themselves to take control of Ruskin College, the students and former students were also themselves mobilising against that attempt. And so, just quickly go through the steps they took. In, in, in October 1908, they formed what they call the League of the Plebs. Now, why did they call it the League of the Plebs? It was partly a reference to the pamphlet by Daniel de Leon, which I mentioned earlier on, and, but it was partly also showing that they had a knowledge of Roman history as well as Buxton. Uh, later in that same term, then, they produced a pamphlet which is called The Burning Question of Education, and that itself is also an echo of the title of a document by Daniel de Leon, which is called The Burning Question of Trade Unionism. And in this they argued, as Dennis Hurd had argued to Lord Curzon, that Ruskin should have a more satisfactory relation to the Labour movement. In January 1909, they began to set up local classes in the working class areas where they had come from, in South Wales and in the North East and in the North West and various other places. And in February, they <coughs> launched the publication, the Plebs magazine, and just to explain that that magazine was still being published in 1964, and um, so, I can't find one. Right, okay, so, right, now what have just the events now moved to apply that to basically, which is what we're coming to. In, in March 1909, obviously you can see that the two conflicting forces were impinging on that one little institution at that moment. And in March 1909, the executive of the college, which was now fully uh, packed with people that didn't like the principal, Dennis Hurd, um, demanded that he resign on the ground. These are the grounds they wanted him to resign on, that he was failing to maintain discipline. 
So in fact, he was the only person who the students would listen to or, or cooperate with. And one could see that as a response <coughs> to the exchange between him and Lord Curzon and his general fact that he was aligning himself with the students. Uh, for some reason, which I can't explain, he didn't tell the students about that until the 26th of March. But when he told them, and, and he had to, re his resignation was forced, all the students, all 54 then, uh, agreed overwhelmingly to boycott all lectures there, except his, <laughs> until he was reinstated. So the strike, when it says the Ruskin College strike, it really means that boycott for specific lectures. Um, and this action was solid, it continued until the 6th of April, and this is the point that it not only that, it became national headlines in the national newspapers at the time. And I think one can see why that was, because no one would believe that people like miners and railway workers would take on the poshest university, arguably on the planet, over a question of education in the way that they've done. Um, uh, just to quickly bring round it off then, during that, in quote, strike, the governors of Ruskin College did proceed to sack the principal Dennis Hurd, and opinion amongst those strikers then swung in favour of setting up their own separate central, what they called Central Labour College. And uh, they, the, the executive of the college closed Ruskin College for two weeks and paid the students their fears to go back the areas they come from. But some of them remained in Oxford and with other people they organised such a central labour college which was launched and opened actually in September 1909. Now, so that, that college, you know, was in Oxford at first and then it, it moved to London, to Earl's Court in London in 1911, and it continued until 1929. And, um, with Dennis Hurd, Dennis Hurd was the principal at first, or warden rather at first. Right, so just to say something quickly about the aftermath of these events. Plebs magazine, as I explained, continued until the 1960s. Actually, in a certain form, it continued until 1917. But it continued without a single break in publication, monthly till 1964. The Central Labour College, I just explained. The Plebs League became the National Council of Labour Colleges. And we could talk about how that occurred and who did that. But it, and it, that continued until that continued 1964. It had a correspondence department and a publishing house. In, in, in 19, the high point in 1926 to 27, there were 1,201 classes, Plebs League or NCLC classes running across Britain, including in Scotland as well. And, and there were 31,000 more than 31,000 people studying in those classes. Now obviously there's a lot we could say, there may well be people here that know more, but people who, uh, it did change its character, but, but nevertheless it continued until 1964, at which point the TUC suppressed it, and the kind of trade union education that you have now was brought into being in the late 60s, which we could also talk about. But if it's okay with you, I'm, I'm, I would like to, uh, stop there and if, if there are any questions or whatever you want. Thank, thank you very much for listening. My idea, if you'll go with this, is just to spend three or four minutes with somebody next to you to say what would you think an education specifically aimed at empowering working class thinking should have within it? You know, what would work independent working class education today, what would it look like? So grab the person next to you. Let's just calm down. <laughs> and then just think about you know, what would working class education an education appropriate to working class people's needs. What would it contain? What would it look like? So find someone to talk about it through. Thank you. <laughs>
Take advantage of the nice food at the back whenever you want to. I'm going to do a second. So, anybody shout out anything we think should be be part of this? Who'd like to start us off? I would volunteer uh, a knowledge of the laws of the land, the shared values it, it, that are enacted in law. Uh, I like the thought of uh, the. The, these, this was a tradition that you could argue goes back to the, the, the code of Hammurabi, uh, where in the marketplace you, you'd see all of the What's the Hammurabi? Oh, well, you better explain this, that, I think. This, this, this is somebody who lived many, many moons ago in the Fertile Crescent. So I, I, I can't give you, give you much more of a knowledge on this. But uh, there's, there's lots of instances of, of the laws of the land being put in a very public place. Before there was literacy, it was a symbol that uh, there was shared values. Okay. And then it would cause conversation. Another one? Yes, please. Um, I would uh, teach. I'm talking more about young, younger people here. You know, educated people. Young people. More like my age. I don't know. My son. <laughs> My son, my grandson, they're Thatcher children. They were brought up under Thatcherism. Yeah, and um, they don't know what they've lost. You know what they've lost. Mm -hmm. So I give them a bit of a history of the, you know, the whole labour movement, the trade union movement, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they have a real sense of self and empowerment. You know, it's gone. It's gone. They don't have that. They and don't it's know sure it. Is. There's no such thing as society, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a writer of social science fiction about the Welsh head martyr of my generation. Right. I've explained a great deal about Alan White's uh, contributionist or Moylewind syllabus after his little name, uh, uh, that all the children should be taught about the history of their countries and all of Europe uh, and, and to go practical exercises like on a wet Sunday, come with me and look at megaliths and then go around their pipes. Uh, ancient buildings, a hands-on experience of the past and with other practical things that would give them a head start in the cruel wide world, like superior command of applied maths, superior command of cookery and of uh, recycling technology, make the build one house from uh, recycled materials. That kind of uh, bricks and mortar Christianity could be even more. So practical hands-on stuff is yeah. part of the way that we learn. One thing on? I was going to say, Keith, just as you wound up the the one-to-one -one discussion. In my days at Ruskin, the thing that always struck me was I used to go to the Oxford Union quite a lot, and I had a fantastic time. But the kids that came from public school, the confidence they, they had mm. in public speaking was out of this world. And you are talking 17, 18, 19 year old kids. And I'm not saying working class kids aren't confident, but I always remember this young lad, he'd be nearly my age now, and he spoke for half an hour about why Nelson Mandela should not have been released. And I never should heard, not have been released. should not have been released, but I never heard a more articulate under first year undergraduate. <coughs> and I just thought, you know, my background, we didn't have that opportunity. We didn't have that opportunity to debate, to develop your ideas, to develop your logic, to develop your arguments. Yeah? And it's always stuck in my mind 20 years later. So I'm going to move on a bit. So ideas about common understandings and laws and traditions and values, practical, hands-on stuff in a variety of ways, self-confidence to speak and advocate. More ideas? The policy that's already in place is equal opportunities. And that is the core of the education system that's compulsive between 5 and 16. And that equal opportunities for all. And 
that's why they got rid of the 11 plus in, in, because if you're forcing kids to go to school by law then equal opportunities has to be the core of that period from 5 to 16 without dividing kids because uh, if you do divide them you're going to go down the road to racism as well because the two can go hand in hand quite easily and that's what you don't want but there are some people here who are under 30 most of us here are over 30 do you think younger people tend to be less prejudiced these days than it was the case when I was growing up 60 years ago do you think there's been a change? Well, I think they're, they're less prejudiced by lots of things I do. now I agree. And than our generation were young because I remember racist teachers in school uh, that I now know were expressing racist views but I couldn't quite put it together that's a big smile, so I think you have a right to say something. Um, I think we're um, speaking for every under 30 here now, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're less prejudiced in those ways, uh, and we don't speak with those words anymore, but I think there's pretty much an equal amount of prejudice, it's just about different issues. So yeah. racism, no, it's no longer an accepted prejudice, but prejudice about um, polyamory is. I think we've just moved on to the next prejudice. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that um, the whole UK thing is going to bring out all kinds of racism we thought had gone and then reappeared. On the voice. A last one, a last comment before we actually some direct questions of Colin about things he said. Please. Um, I remember this question being asked when I was training to be a teacher many years ago. Education. Was it me? No. <laughs> and uh, there was a quote from John Dewey who mm -hmm. said, Before you decide on the institutions that you want in your society, you have to decide on the, the nature of the society that you want. So maybe the question should be what kind of hospitals do you want? Or education system, if we have a system at all, what it should look like, or what kind of society do we want, and then we build the institutions necessary to maintain and develop that society. What kind of society? Is there another one before we move on to the next section? Yes. I, I You've already had one. You've been great. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, does anybody else have one? We want to object. What? We want to object. <laughs> okay. I, uh, something I, th I think is really important is to understand uh, sustainability. I, th I think more than ever before, we have to understand resources, their limits, and how not to be wasteful, and understand what sustainability means to our communities in our own proximity. And I'll just add one thing of my own, which is that there's a, a national organisation which I think reaches into Scotland, Wales and Ireland, which is called the General Federation of Trade Unions, which actually provides much more political education for trade unionists than, say, the TUC does, and the, and the union loan structure does. And people like Colin and myself and Rob and Dave and Louise are trying to write a curriculum, a kind of exciting weekend about how you can learn from the past to make the future more what we want it to be. So we're trying to write that just now, and we'll be doing this in, in uh, the new the next year. So any ideas on that towards the end of the meeting are always very welcome. Things that should be in that kind of curriculum. It needs to be exciting, it needs to be about now. It needs to learn from the kind of things that Colin's talked about. Are there some direct questions to Colin? He gave an account of the late 19th century and the struggles that emerged into the, the end of the 20th century. Particular questions of clarification or how many guns do you want? You want <laughs> Just the one, please. Go on. Go on. <laughs> Colin, yeah. you know you were talking before about um, the importance of um, importing socialist literature. And where, where would you place the likes of Charles Kerr within that? Because that, to me, is one of the key elements of how the... Charles, Charles Kerr, the publishers of Chicago, when oh, they started okay. importing the socialist yeah. literature, yeah. and when, to me, that's where a lot of it where it starts from. Yeah. I, I just wondered what Do your you thoughts were. Do you know 
No, I don't. Uh, but it, yeah, it, basically, what, what I was trying to say that um, what one of the effects of the, what, one the situation I was trying to describe was partly shaped by the fact that this publisher in Chicago, Charles Kerr, um, is, issued um, low price. Um, low price editions of some of the what one might regard as kind of crucial socialist literature at that time. And that was the only way you can still get, you still can see, including when I referred to Josip Dietzgen, you know, in the context of philosophy. Well, um, I think, if I remember right, I think I'm right in saying that his book, The Positive Outcome of Philosophy, was published by this publishing house in Chicago, and they were imported into Britain through the Socialist Labour Party group in, in um, Edinburgh, basically. So, and, and Daniel de, Leon, de Leon's ideas that I spoke of also came through the same sources and through that group of people. And then they spread, their, they were kind of conveyed into the northeast, uh, I think, from that source. And they found their way to Oxford, actually. There were only six branches of the Socialist Labour Party in England, but so the stronghold of it was in where we are now, actually in this country, and th that publisher was, was through that. And so I think it played a key role, yeah. Another question? You could consider how extremely difficult it was to get hold of those things at that time, it seemed, and what people could understand about things, depending on what, whether they could or could not get those books. Another question, Alex? Um, you said that you could talk a bit about how Ruskin was funded. I'm interested oh. in... The, the financial support, the logistical support that came to manifest it? Well, 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 well I'll, I'll say it, um, for the sake of any people that weren't necessarily here at the beginning, I, I was trying to explain that um, it was founded by two um, American postgraduate students at Oxford, um, um, Walter Vrooman and Charles Beard, but the wife of one of those two Amni Vrooman, later her, 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 her unmarried name was Amni Graflin. It was a legacy of hers that was used to set it up. And, and she left, actually, um, after she separated from Walter Vrooman, and she lived, he died in 1909, but she continued through, and she continued to support Ruskin College after the uh, split and the strike with sums of money through at least to the 1920s. So I, I think basically, so it was set up on that money from that woman. And they also set up Ruskin colleges in, in some parts of the states, using a similar thing, you see. So, but it was always kind of, it never was a massive amount. It was just, you know, even like a thousand or something like that, which is quite obviously more then, but yeah. So basically it was that. But then, then obviously then unions began, first of all union branches, and then after this, Split, then much larger uh, national unions then began to put money into it. You see. Okay. Thank you. What was the position of the unions once they sacked this guy? Was it him? After the sacking. Of him, because you've seen that these yeah. are active trade unionists, so presumably they went back to their branches or the national <laughs> yeah. executives and yeah. said. Well, well, the governors included um, people who, who were. Prominent trade unionists, uh, like I think one of those called um, the chap was Shackleton, that was one of them, the, 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 who was also an MP. Some, in other words, there were people among the governors who, who colluded, it, fully colluded in that. And, and I think it's a deeper, and which I think you're probably saying, with a broader and deeper point as well. Uh, basically, the, the unions that, can, that took the, the students side were the South Wales Miners Federation and the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, which soon after became the NUR. Uh, um, the NUR. So, and it was them that sustained it. So, the reason why the Central Labour College collapsed in 1929 was partly because of what had been done to the miners union, you know, by the effect of the general strike and all the things that we know. So um, that was not the only reason, but because there was other problems. But but that was so. so but as regards those union leaders, I mean, the question, the question, underlying question, really is, did they want something like that? Obviously, that that's a key point, isn't it? Did they really want rank and file people who would have 
being thus educated, you might well oppose them. So that, that's, all, that's the main point I would make about it. Um, but obviously later, in 19, there was, there was always a set of trade union, especially the Iron and Steel Trades Confederation under Arthur Pugh, who in 1919 joined with the WEA to create the Workers' Educational Trade Union Committee, which was set up before, but basically against what the National Council of Labour Colleges, which emerged from the Plebs League. Uh, so um, both of those things continued through until 1964, and both of them were suppressed by the General Secretary of the TUC, George Woodcock, former Ruskin College and Oxford University student in 1964. So presumably all these different colleges that are getting set up just reflect the kind of politics that are prevalent in the unions, different yes, unions I think, at the time. I think, right, I think that, that's, a full, that's a superficiality of my kind of presentation, I mean, in ways that I haven't, but, you know, because kind of, of time, but that needs to be absolutely to be pursued within that, within that order. I mean, there's a great deal that could be said about the period after 1909, you know, and then would, at that dimension would, would be crucial to address things. So, because I know you got you got tensions between general unions that were just well, coming in right, right, there, right, right, the right. craft that's unions right. who yeah. saw themselves as you know more of the elite. Yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Well, well uh, quite a number of the people that were the students that were at Ruskin College at that time included some of the most. Mm -hmm. militant and active labor, um, activists in the country, some of whom within a couple of years were leading the Cambrian Combine strike in South Wales, you know, which was a set virgin on an insurrection in which Winston Churchill saw fit to send people armed with machine, soldiers armed with machine guns ready to shoot them down. Uh, and um, a lot of them were, belonged to an organization called the AIU, Advocates of industrial unionism. So, so the, the, it was the idea, you know, that, that craft craft unions should be replaced by industrial unions that organise the work, all the workers in a given field. Was was a strong idea amongst them, which is not necessarily the same thing as syndicalism. Syndicalism came a little bit later, yeah. but you know that, that's an interesting question. But the, they, they certainly, I think, also, they certainly were kind of like a from below rank of, insofar as they had an ethos about that. Mo although most of them belonged to the Independent Labour Party, actually, very few of them actually belonged to the Socialist Labour Party. But nevertheless, they certainly came with that ethos of from below industrial unionism, which to me was, I think, was right. But not so, everybody necessarily I think agree. it's time to move on now. And I've got two things to say, really. One is, you might want to spend three minutes grabbing some food before we start again and move about. Secondly, I'm temporarily sapped now because I, I can't introduce Rob. I've got a far better <laughs> introducing <laughs> person here. <laughs> so in three minutes' time or even two, we'll start again. Cheers,